All right. <laughs> so uh, should we give him a couple of minutes or uh, are we going to go ahead and start it? I think we can we can get started. Uh, in fact, uh, let's describe the stage. Uh, this slide that you had, I don't know who wants to go for it. Uh, Jacob could go ahead. So uh, faculties, I think uh, Chabam Lee is here. Um, uh, is Brandon Shally Fox a academic sponsor? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Arizona. Okay, and uh, Ramus, uh, what school he's from? Yeah, so I'm from Western in Can Western University in Canada. Got you. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Lee Zhu is here. I think she's from UT Austin, right? Yep. Okay, so we have uh, one, two, three, four sponsors. So uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned Dr. Lee. Oh. Dr. Smith is representing uh, UNC Charlotte uh, temporarily. So we got five. All right. Call that a quorum. All right, Jacob, take it away. Okay, uh, go to the next slide. I think this was up a minute ago, but these are the uh, stages that uh, we've made with help from New Way. Um, I think you could just go ahead and put all the labels out. There you go. Um, so to, to make these gradings, we need to uh, have an XY stage. So we've built an uh, air bearing stages. Um, so these steel guideways you can see have been uh, ground and I think electroplated um, by New Way and um, if aluminum carriages on top, um, they're magnetic preloads with uh, four air bearing pads on, uh, on each stage. Um, the actuator is a voice call actuator. I think, um, I think, uh, I think it has like six. It oh, really? To have the top and two on the side. That's right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, that's right. So it's uh, um, got six pads. Um, but um, so we're using, so we're using voice calls for the actuators um, and uh, linear uh, scales with um, optical encoder read heads to, for the feedback. Um, and I guess the, the teams also have access to line capacitance gauges um, and I think one additional voice call to create their Z stage. Um, they'll be able to either use this design you can see here or um, use some of the provided designs or come up with their own design um, if they want to. Um, the interface with, of the hardware with the software is a, um, an amplifier box. I'm not sure if we have any pictures of that. Yeah, um, we do. Oh, we don't have to go too far ahead, but uh, oh yeah, there it is. So um, the, uh, the encoders will be uh, plugged directly into the um, ADCs of that amplifier box and um, the voice calls will be plugged into that amplifier box as well which will be controlled with a voltage controlled uh, current amplifier. So um, all of that will be um, talking to an FPGA program on the uh, National Instruments MyRios uh, and a uh, sort of top level um, real time program, which will be mostly what the students will be interfacing with, um, will be used to control that FPGA program, uh, which will then control the, the hardware. Uh, so, um, sorry, I've gone pretty out of uh, out of uh, sequence here, but so there's the, the the sort of setup we have right now. We're defining the x-axis as the stroke direction. So the bottom stage is what we're using to um, for the stroke of the gratings, and then we're stepping over with that top axis that is uh, holding the uh, z stage. What else do we have? Oh yeah, so the air bearings need, um, need an air supply. Right now we're running uh, around 75 PSI. And um, I'm not sure the numbers on the consumption, but a, a very small compressor can, very, it can easily provide enough air to run those stages without in, any interruptions. We've had good success with the, um, I think they're called ultra low noise um, compressors from Harbor Freight. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive. And I think we may have plans to provide some of those to the teams as well if they don't have lab air supplies. So yeah. uh, the question, uh, you said that you step in the y-axis and mm -hmm. 
and uh, machining or ruling with the x-axis, right? Correct. So would it make more sense to do it the other way around? Uh, yeah. Since the, or, or since the y-axis has the, the load? Oh yeah, maybe maybe that's the yeah, best way because the, 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 the thought process load is in y, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we would be holding the load static during the during the stroke. Um, yeah. It could be done either way. Uh, but uh, and that could be something that um, if they feel like feel up to it, the teams are more than welcome to mm -hmm. to try either way if they're seeing some sort of um, weird dynamics with uh, one way or the other. That's completely cool to play with. Um, there's yeah, a substantially okay. higher mass on the y-axis than there is on yeah, the Yeah, so X. it makes sense for that one to be the one that steps, right? Yeah, yeah, because that, that whole Z-stage is, is stainless steel, um, so it weighs a good bit. Uh, and you're yeah. putting pretty low force. You're pushing pretty uh, um, lightly on the actual substrate. So the uh, applied force to that scribe stage, that bottom stage, is, is pretty low. So it's running um, pretty uh, pretty freely, and that's what you want because you don't want a um, a very high strung controller pushing that thing. Uh, but on the y axis, you can crank your gains up on your controller pretty high in order to uh, fix at one point uh, and correct pretty quickly back to that one point. Yeah. Whereas if you're chasing a ramp on the bottom stage and you have high controller gains to to mess with and so yeah, a quick, a, sort of a quick uh, overview of this configuration. Uh, uh, Mark Kosmos Kosmoski came up with it, and I think they use it at ESI somewhere. And it's called the slab, according to his uh, definition. And if you notice, the X and the Y don't really have to carry the load of each other, right? The drawback of this is that in order to access the substrate is, is pretty difficult, right? Because it's down below, right? In between, sandwich in between, right? Right. But the stiffness, the overall stiffness is much better than if you stack the two, right? Yeah, and the substrate's being held on a um, on a vacuum chuck, and that chuck is removable. So um, it's an aluminum plate uh, with the vacuum holes on it, and you'll be able to just loosen four screws, and uh, you might, yeah, I guess you can see there the plate that, is holding the sample. Um, you can re remove those screws or just loosen those screws and pull that plate out to place your sample um, and to access it. You will need to, and the Z stage that we sort of designed is um, will allow for this, but you will need to be able to get a driver down to those uh, bolts. So you need to keep that in mind to access your sample. So uh, one thing I wanted to add about the air supply is uh, Right now, the plan is if the uh, conference takes place at uh, Minnesota, we'll bring those air compressors. And for the teams to start working on the gradings, uh, we believe most of the labs will have the air supply. If not, uh, if you ask us, we would be happy to uh, uh, send them the compressor and the air tank. Right. Okay, we'll try to go in order now. <laughs> now I know we've been jumping around. <laughs> Um, so this is the Z stage I've already mentioned. Um, Kumar, if you can just put the labels out. So like I said, we use a voice call to actuate, to, to apply the force onto the substrate. Um, and the flexor leaf springs are, are constraining that force into the Z motion um, or the Z direction. Uh, and that capacitance probe there is measuring the deflection of those springs uh, with respect to the frame. Um, so the idea here is that if we measure the current that we're sending to the voice call, we can calculate the force applied by that voice, voice call. And if we know the stiffness of the spring, we can use the measured displacement from the capacitance probe to compute the um, opposed force of those springs pushing back against the voice call actuator. And the difference between those two forces, um, so if the, if the tip is just sitting up in air, and you push down a little bit with the voice call, the springs will push back until you reach some equilibrium. Um, and so your applied force there is zero because you're not touching anything. But once you apply enough force to move the tip down and touch the uh, sample, the uh, capacitance probe value will stop changing because you touch the sample and your force, you can continue to increase the force. Uh, 
Um, so the difference between your voice coil force and your spring force um, is the applied force on the surface. And so if we control that applied force to a specified value, um, we can then, um, independent of the uh, sort of geometry or the form of the substrate, we can apply a constant force and create a hopefully constant uh, depth uh, grading. Uh, now you could go the other way of, of uh, uh, depth controlling. If you assume that your sample is relatively flat, um, then you could just control to a constant depth and, and plow directly across. We haven't tried that, um, but it could be a viable uh, way to go. Uh, so this is the design that we've been using for the past, past few months. Uh, we've created pretty, pretty good gradings with it, and I think we'll, we'll provide um, drawings and, and descriptions of this design to the teams if they want to use that, um, that stage. Yeah, and uh, one point to be noted is uh, we are making uh, grading lines uh, into the page that is in the uh, stiff axis of the uh, flexure. So uh, the X stage will be moving uh, in this direction. Yeah, yeah. So if you imagine you're, you're plowing that material and the force is sort of trying to oppose the, uh, the tool. And so the, the whole parallelogram there is trying to twist uh, and so if you had rotated that stage 90 degrees and you're still plowing in the same direction, you're allowing that twisting motion to be um, translated into those flexure leaves um, a little bit easier than if you were than in this configuration here. Um, and we learned that by doing it wrong the first time. Um, yeah, so this is the, uh, this is the theoretical uh, grading that you're trying to make. A three millimeter by three millimeter patch uh, with a 20 micrometer step over. Um, the ideal grading would have no landings, it would have sharp peaks between the lines, um, and it would be uh, have a dead on 20 micrometer pitch. Uh, so, one thing we found is that um, there can be some issues as you approach a sharp edge between the gratings um, because the copper will get pushed over into the adjacent lines. Um, so that's something to watch out for as you approach a perfect grating or, or a crisp break between the lines um, is that you may have material being moved in one direction or the other. Um, so the nominal uh, amplitude of those gratings would be around four micrometers if you were to get the geometry um, correct, the depths correct. And this is because the, um, the, the V of the scribe tool is at 135 degrees included angle. Um, so we've played around with the lead angle of the, of the V. I guess if you imagine that diamond tool as a, as a boat kind of cutting through the copper, we have the, the head of the boat picked up off the water. And so you're cutting with the bottom of the boat, the back bottom. Um, so that lead angle is, it can be important um, in the, in the inter interaction of the copper substrate with the diamond tool. Uh, we found that around a five degree angle between the sample and the diamond to be ideal, um, but that's another, that's another parameter that can be played with uh, to try to get cleaner gradings. Uh, and, and in this design, so I guess if you go back in that Z stage design, we have um, a, a holder for the diamond tool. If you go one more, go forward. Right there, uh, go back, two, two slides, one more, there. So we can adjust that angle. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see the sort of uh, assembly that holds the diamond tool um, and, and you, can, uh, you can loosen a screw and adjust that angle um, how you want to, to get better gradings. Okay. Yeah, so here's some of the gradings that we've been making. Um, in the bottom left, you can see a um, commercial Renishaw grading. Um, this also has a 20 micrometer step over. You can see very large uh, landings between them. Uh, I think this is mainly used as uh, rules. I don't know if they're used as uh, a grading, but I could be wrong. Um, 
Yeah, I think they are and used as see, uh, line scales. That's yeah. So those they, they actually they use the total inter internal reflection of those grooves, and of course they have a uh, like a mask on the encoder, so they get either dark or clear depending where you are, right? Yeah, that's right. And okay. So, but they look at about uh, a couple millimeters square, so they do a lot of uh, averaging because of that, right? It doesn't matter if there's particles of dust in the on the surface because they're looking at a large area. Cool. Yeah, so this is uh, kind of what we're comparing our gradings to. Um, and so up at the top, you can see different forces that we've played with um, from 100 millinewtons to 200 millinewtons. Um, and with low forces, you have these large flats between the Vs. Um, you can see on the, on the middle picture there, as we increase the force, you can see this uh, material uh, being deposited on either side of these, um, on those flats. And then as you increase the force, um, you can see that the Vs aren't quite symmetric anymore. You're getting some material being pushed over into the previous uh, line. So if you look at the very top line there, that's the last, great, that's the last line that was made. Um, and that one looks pretty V-shaped. Um, the, the bright line there is the bottom and the, the dim areas are these slopes going up. And the line before it, right below, has a, uh, a wide area on the bottom and a narrow edge on the top. And that's because the last line pushed material over into the line before it. Um, so this would be a scenario where using too much force would create sort of a blazed grating. And so you wouldn't have a nice uh, symmetric uh, pattern coming off of your grating, you would have um, a pattern coming off to one direction. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of what's happening is that that uh, wall is being crushed by the previous uh, or by the next line. The previous wall is being crushed by the next one. So it does look like force is going to be something that is important to control and to verify an ideal force. Yeah, force or uh, groove depth, right? One of those. Yeah, yeah. So those will be somewhat intertwined. And there's room to, to do different sort of, um, uh, to play around with different methods. Um, you can do as many things as you want. You can scribe twice. You can scribe and skip lines. You could, whatever you wanted to do to try to make that material go into different directions or into different places where it's not interfering with other lines. As you try to approach a uh, lower amounts of, of flats between your lines or smaller flats between your lines. Right. I think it's important to say that this is a, a not a material removal process, but more of a cold forming process. You're forming these, uh, these grooves as opposed to cutting a groove and removing a material. Yeah. Yeah. And this copper is super soft. So you're moving that material around very easily. Uh, if I'm understanding right, Ray, um, and, and that's why you're getting these effects. Um, is, is you have the material has to go somewhere. It's not being removed as a chip. Right. Right. Uh, in this uh, SCM measurement that uh, uh, Chunji made, uh, you can see uh, the uh, blazed or non-symmetrical grooves that uh, Jacob was mentioning about. So these are the uh, material that was plowed uh, during the earlier line that gets deposited uh, in, uh, Sorry, the the material that was removed currently will get deposited on the uh, groove that was uh, made previously. That's what you're seeing here. And these are uh, this is how the uh, grading look during the beginning of the stroke. I think uh, the controller might still be settling down. That's what's causing this. And uh, this is at the end of the stroke. Yeah, and you can see the effect of that lead angle on the tool, in that at the very end of the stroke, where the tool picks up out of the material you have a full V back towards, uh, away from the end, where it comes to a point towards the end of the uh, stroke. And that's because um, the, the tool isn't uh, fully engaged with the sample. 
uh, in the top right, you can see a little better of what I was talking about on the sort of top left line there. You can see clean um, grooves or, or clean uh, slopes to that groove. And on the previous line before it, you can see one clean wall and one rough wall. Um, and and our, our best hypothesis there is that that last line has pushed copper material over into the previous line and caused uh, that mushroom or collapse of the wall. So uh, yeah, we sent uh, one of these uh, gradings that we made to uh, Zeiss and uh, Paul measured this grading using their uh, confocal scanner. And we can see the uh, uh, non-symmetrical gradings that we made. And the uh, uh, calculated angle uh, comes out to the included angle of uh, uh, 135. So if they, if this um, crushing was not happening, if there was a, a symmetrical line on the other side, that would be 135 degrees. And the amplitude is a little larger than uh, four micrometers because we might be pushing deeper into the material. And the pitch uh, was uh, 15 micrometer instead of being uh, 20 micrometers. So, uh, we made a different sample uh, later on with uh, reduced force, which was somewhere around uh, 200 millinewton, and that was the grading. And uh, we measured this grading with the uh, Zygo Z gauge that's uh, available in uh, uh, CPM UNC Charlotte. The measurement was made with a uh, 50 times objective. And uh, from the measurement result, uh, we took uh, six slices and plotted them one on top of the other. So. All this shows us if you use the right force or the right groove depth, you can make uh, uh, symmetric gradings with a uh, uh, four micrometer expected uh, groove depth. And the standard deviation of uh, these uh, six uh, slices was less than uh, half a micrometer. So yeah, this is where we are with uh, validating uh, the working of the stage and the processes and everything uh, so that the teams could uh, uh, go on with, and Lewis could explain uh, uh, what we would provide and uh, what they expect in the uh, coming days when the challenge gets kicked on. Well, um, the, most of the parts here already been uh, sort of went over, uh, so it's no need to repeat. Except maybe that there will be consulting sessions uh, with uh, we have a sort of in, industry industry type of uh, uh, individuals that are going to help us either to do. One-to-one uh, -one, um, consulting, or if we want to do the whole group, we can invite, depending what the the questions are, and and this will be once we get the students in, involved, right? Uh, one thing is not listed here is that we would like to have make sure that the students don't spend too much time with this. So that's where lies the the biggest issue that I see with with this challenge is that we're trying to make it about manufacturing, but it's hard to get into manufacturing uh, without having to be worried about controls and, and as well as metrology and uh, the mechanical part of the machine, right? So uh, in order to maybe, in order to try to facilitate all that, uh, we're providing the controls, the controls that will work because we actually tested, as you can see, right? I say we, but it's actually been uh, between Jacob and Kumar, right? And anyway, uh, that will help in a lot in uh, reducing the amount of work from the students having to create the mechanical and the controls, as well as the metrology, we're saying that uh, we'll, we'll provide the opportunity for you to ship uh, some of these uh, samples to size. Uh, of course, it's only be limited to, uh, we'll see in the calendar in the next page when we go there, but we're only, depending if we're going to do it in virtual or we're going to do it in person, would be only two opportunities to do that. In between that, if you want to get some idea how your gradients are working, uh, Team Darlimpo is working on a, in a sort of a laser, uh, camera uh, set up that you can expose the grading and and be able to tell how well uh, the pitch and other things that uh, how repeatable it is and even uh, other other features of the grading right 
Uh, we hope that's not going to take a lot of time because ideally we, we're asking the students not to spend more than 20 hours uh, during the first month and 20 hours during the second month. And that way they can uh, concentrate on, on what they had to do at school, right? That's always been the biggest issue, this uh, challenge. Now, if they want to spend more time, I don't, I don't uh, have any issue with that. And I'm assuming that you guys either because they're and at the end of the day, they're learning probably. Yep. Uh, but they could do the comfort, they could do the, the challenge with only 20 hours if they wish to by uh, distributing the work between the, all the students and then uh, delegating or, or trusting that what we're providing is okay. Now, what we need at the school would be clean air and uh, around 80 or 75 PSI for what we were seeing, and as well the National Instrument Mind Rio, which we could provide if you guys don't have. Let's see anything else. Uh, we're, we're looking at hopefully we'll have uh, donations that will allow us to give these 4,000, 2,000, and 1,000 uh, price uh, for the first three teams. And we want to have a, a grading rubric that we hope we're going to get from this meeting, uh, from your feedback, and based on what we looking right now is we, even if they were to do uh, mechanical controls upgrades, we were not going to grade those. Uh, that's, we're going to grade, try to grade the machining part. That way it's a true manufacturing. Now, if they come up with the new invention, how to uh, measure this, if, again, we won't uh, provide any uh, value on that. At least that's the plan right now. So to discourage them from trying to reinvent the wheel, right? And of course, the biggest issue we have is some schools might have the top uh, caliper instruments and some schools might not even have anything. Uh, so to uh, level that field, we're thinking uh, by being provided third-party company that can measure will help us with that. Now, what's the biggest issue is that if you have to wait uh, a long time before you get your feedback and then modify your process. Uh, that's the part I still don't know how it's going to work. Let's go to the next page. And uh, one thing I wanted to add was uh, the uh, uh, the laser uh, diffraction uh, camera technique that uh, Tim's working on. We will uh, provide a detailed uh, guideline on uh, how to implement it to the students. And that that's will true, comprise yeah. basically um, use a laser pointer um, point it at the specimen, project the diffraction pattern onto just a white piece of uh, white screen, white piece of board, uh, and then record that with a camera. And, and from those images, um, you should be able to get at least a gauge of the quality. And that's what, we're, that's what Tim's working on. That's right. So, but I don't know how involved is going to get. So we'll, we'll figure out uh, by having mm -hmm. some of us try, trying to do that procedure and uh, to try to limit to make sure we don't have the students spend too much time on that, but get the feedback they need to uh, modify their, their forces or their procedure they're trying to develop. Now, regarding the dates, uh, so far, uh, this is what we have. June 1st, we'll open registration. Uh, note here is by invitation only, uh, due to we have only eight uh, stages or systems, right? Then ideally the hardware will arrive uh, to the schools on September 1st. Uh, if they uh, say uh, students have uh, their samples, the first samples ready, they could ship them by September 24th. That way we, when we do that uh, online review, meet review, right? Uh, where they present some of the results to the judges and we'll provide uh, feedback. Uh, we have something that they can show, right? That has been sort of a measure professionally. And this is where it gets a little bit uh, uh, difficult because we don't know at this point if the conference is going to be virtual or live. Assuming that it will be virtual, uh, they also will have to ship some samples on October 22nd. Uh, that will sort of be the final measurement. And as well as they'll, uh, they will provide the results by October 29th. So they can uh, be, make a part of their final report 
that it will be in also for October 29. That final report will be this will be there disregarded will be virtual or online. And finally, uh, if we go to the conference, we'll have uh, the students present the results. Uh, actually, the students do that part that is actually in orange at the conference where they'll um, rule uh, so some gradings and then we'll measure them right there and provide the feedback right, right there, which will be ideal. Uh, and finally, this November the 2nd will be, typically we'll do it at, at lunchtime, uh, but this will be give to a number of students will probably be a two hour lunchtime during the conference where they do the presentation uh, to the judges and will be 50 minutes each team. That's sort of, this is the plan, but of, of course it's not in stone, it's still pre preliminary. And we already went too long with, with all this. So maybe this is time for you guys to give us some feedback and maybe suggest other ways that we can uh, go about the, the challenge and what is what would you like to see, right? So we can sort of try to modify the plan. So anyone that wants to go first? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that, I mean, you, what you guys have done so far is really excellent. And I think this will set the students all along on a, a good path to actually focusing on the process, the manufacturing process. Um, so that's, I think that's really great what you guys have done. Um, I had a question um, about the winning condition. <laughs> Is it, is it basically an optical requirement at the end or is it a dimensional requirement based on the Zeiss measurements? Like, is it, is it diffraction efficiency, um, full width half max of the first order peak um, scattering, et cetera? Or is it, you know, dimensional requirements within certain spatial frequency bands? So why do you guys, what is what you guys think? Uh, we're trying to make uh, diffraction grading. So maybe the optical part would be the most important part, right? I, I mean, I'm in favor of that because it gives the students here an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that um, uh, it'll be a combination. So it'll be, uh, um, uh, and, and that hasn't been fully developed, but certainly it will incorporate diffraction efficiency. But we're also contemplating uh, symmetry of the grating as being uh, uh, included in the rubric. So you, okay, so you don't want blazed, a blaze no. on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just because it's easier to measure when you have symmetry with the simple method, but it's not ideal if you're trying to make, uh, for a lot of applications, blaze gradients will be better, right? Yeah. Especially those large speech ones or infrared applications, I'm thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Some, some question from me. So for the tool, is there any adjustment um, with respect of the travel direction, like the feed direction? And I'll explain where my question is coming from. So we're doing V groups with a diamond tool ourselves, the traditional cutting uh, method. And based on the size of the burr, we realize basically we have issues with this kind of alignment, meaning that the tool is actually, the, the ray face of the tool is actually pointing sideways. And the issue with that is actually very hard to control that. So now seeing, seeing this travel again, basically I have the same question, is, is the bottom of the boat parallel or can be adjusted in order to, to be parallel with the, with the feed direction? Yeah, I think it's up to the teams to uh, uh, decide on that, depending on uh, the manufacturing processes that they came come up with, it is yeah. possible it, it, based on the setup that's there. Okay. Yeah, you can adjust the uh, the left right, I guess, um, uh, of the of the tool, and, and you can also adjust the the angle uh, of the rake face or how high the rake face is um, is pitched up. So um, a lot of that is adjustable, but that may may mean that it's not super stiff. Um, so that's something that the teams are, are definitely allowed to, to, uh, play around with and change if they see fit. Um, all that stuff can be taken apart, um, with a, a three millimeter hex driver, um, or just uh, loosened and adjusted, um, as they want. So that's yeah. definitely something that could be 
um, a, a fun thing to look at is who gets that right or who plays around with it enough to um, to produce quality gradings. Okay, other question. The, the roughness, is there a target or like a recommended roughness for the, for the facets of the, of the group? Do you know what that value is? Like RA, SA, anything like that? No, Better don't. than the other teams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Ideally, for the efficiency, the, the better, the, the would yeah. be better, right? <laughs> okay. Other question about the team itself: uh, How many people are allowed, and if grad students are allowed too, or only undergrad? Like, do you have any rules on this, or it doesn't matter? I would say that ideally more undergrads than than graduate, just so uh, they get the opportunity. They, they get excited about this manufacturing and uh, also is an opportunity for you guys uh, to see uh, before they're going to get into graduate school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to see how interested they are in research. However, uh, we, we have it open to anybody that is going to school, right? Okay. And how okay. many? How many? Like what uh, is it? Four is optimal, but in the past we've uh, had a request to add one more member. So five could be done, but three okay. or four is optimal. Okay, thank you. Uh, my point is the more the better because that way you, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it, right? They, in, in theory, they can distribute, but sometimes what we've seen during the last five years is one student will pick all the load, right? And that's not fair, right? Now, there's also the option that, uh, that we will encourage you guys to do, and which it might not be fair for everybody, but to give them credit for this work, right? somehow they make it part of, of the school. Uh, and that way they are not just doing it for the fun. Uh, so this always been a sort of an issue, right? Mm -hmm. But why not? Yeah. We are currently seeking funding to further support student participants. Um, we haven't got that funding yet, but we're seeking it. So we will be limited to the number of students that we could support in terms of registration, tuition, etc., cetera. Um, but that's something that we're looking for. I mean, yeah, the, the other part is if this is from the NSF, might be only for the yeah. US universities. It's only US universities, yeah. But however, uh, in, oh, in uh, last point. year, we had enough funding from industry that we were able to sponsor uh, the University of Hong Kong too, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So all, all depend on the contributions we get. Right. Yeah, I mean, we don't mind like to to you know fund some of them, maybe not all of them. Like if it comes, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. not necessarily a big deal. Thank you. Good. So, any any more questions, comments from... on the controller end? Um, I foresee that being an issue um, for the students here. I don't think they have a lot of uh, experience with control um tuning or anything like that um is the i saw you had a, a vi um for the controller with the ni rio um is that pretty much all they would need or do they are they expected to do some tuning of that control loop if they use the default design i think uh, the tuning should be okay right okay. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and they'll be able to help too if, if they need, if they, if they if, let's say they see chatter or things like that, vibrations, we should be able to help at any time, right? Yeah, we don't want this to be, I think, a, we don't want this to be a controls challenge. This is more of a manufacturing. So any of that stuff, we're more than help, happy to help that along. Yeah, and that's I something that we're looking for feedback on too, is how can we make it um, easier to focus on one discipline you know, um, so we're not making it uh, too much to do. And uh, we will provide a detailed documentation of uh, how the controllers uh, are right now implemented and the teams are uh, welcome to uh, play with it as well. Great. I think, I think if the students address this like a, a process improvement project or challenge, you know, and understand and, and as they go through and they create their first grading, evaluate it, try and determine what adjustments they need to make. And, and I think those would be some of the things they would want to present uh, in their report. Don't you, Gary? Mm -hmm. 
Correct. Yep. Yep. I hope to ask how much um, instruction, like how detailed is the, are the instructions are going to be to give to the students? Uh, for example, the slides or the like the, the experiments uh, that I, Jacob and Kumar has done, are the, those going to be presented to the students? Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be all, everything that we will have will be given to everybody to make it fair, right? Ideally too, when a team will ask a question, we'll share that uh, response to everybody. So we're trying to do as, as good as is possible to be fair with everybody, which is always impossible, but at least trying, right? That's awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, then uh, regarding the calendar, uh, are you guys okay with the current uh, dates and the plan of the the current uh, workload too of trying to target the 20 hours per month? Because it's basically two months we're looking at, September and October, right? Uh, and then I don't know, September is a good, is a good time to start. Um, Usually, August is where the school starts, right? So maybe by doing a September 1st, we'll give us some time for you guys to sort of make sure everybody's at school and ready to do their mm -hmm. normal chores, right? So I guess I assume it's okay, or I lost connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the sooner the better because uh, you know, November or late October already are busy with midterms, so it becomes it becomes difficult. So, so that's why, as as far as and I don't know if everyone is on the same schedule, but if if we start in, in September, second week of September, that's typically need to avoid the end of October, basically with too many deadlines. So that's why, mm -hmm. as as much as we push it earlier in the term, it's actually easier or better for students to cooperate. So how would you like to shift it? Uh, like, like a week before? A week, Maybe. Yeah. For example, a week before, yes. Okay. Well, it's actually, it actually would be better uh, in a sense because that way uh, when it comes down to the conference, uh, if we had the conference either live or, or virtual, at that point, uh, everything will be completed instead of trying to do it on the last weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Like usually happens. Yeah. So I think you will be okay with shipping, shifting everything one week. Yeah. Unless there's other issues with uh, trying to do that, that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I think I we might suggest, yeah. I would suggest making the like, uh, some uh, instructions and about the background materials to this available to the students earlier uh, sure. before the hard work. So that will be good for them to st start uh, read a bit about the things. Got it. Good. So I, I think I will uh, summarize the, this sort of what we're discussing uh, today so we can share with everybody and make sure everybody agrees before we go ahead and try to change it right but one question like uh Luis, i think you send us some document in onedrive i wasn't able like i don't have access to that so i don't know if you know it's just me or everyone else i think it was in this invitation for the meeting so i tried to access it but, but I, I had access to it the other day and then it disappeared today okay so that's what happened okay. so we'll find another um, way like google drive and copy that a whole thing to Google Drive and try that again. Yeah, that must have been me. I probably changed the uh, uh, title of the presentation to ah. uh, keep track of the revision. And now the this the summary of the meeting uh, will go through email, so it should be okay, right? Right. Yeah. And yeah, I'll you, send this PowerPoint uh, in the email chain after the meeting. So are and you sharing? This, are you sharing this video as well, like the recording? Yeah. Of, okay. Yeah, uh, of course, the video uh, as well, the PowerPoint, uh, I don't think can go through the email. So we'll have to use a, some sort of a drive, right? Yeah. Maybe use a couple of drives to make sure everybody has access. 
Um, uh, I have a question about the, um, yeah. the coherence scanning interferometer. So we have one here that the students can use, um, mm -hmm. but I, since not every school is going to have that, is that something that we're going to disallow students from using? It's hard to keep track of that, right? Uh, yeah. Who knows what they could do, right? <laughs> yeah, they go in at midnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, be a good opportunity right. for the students to learn how to use equipment like that too. So, sure. And it to be use fun it in the, for kind of an application that, that they can directly relate to. So I was going to ask uh, Brandon, can uh, Navajo go over there and do use your device? How, how far are they from us? <laughs> I don't know. It's probably um, like seven hours or something. Yeah, maybe too far, right? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't control that that machine, but um, I know that students here can use it. Yeah. I know this is sort of the, the biggest unfair practice, right? Uh, and But it happens in real life too. So not everybody has the same resources, right? Mm -hmm. So it's part of life. <laughs> so I say that we, if you guys are okay, we can end the meeting now and uh, g gain 10 minutes back. Yeah, I think we have a pretty good list of actions. So, yeah, I, I'm uh, looking that only Shishi and uh, Sorab uh, were not able to attend. So I'll get with them and share the movie, and then uh, uh, we can maybe try to ask, uh, answer, and ask questions that they might have. Right. Mm -hmm. So good. Uh, I guess. Uh, thank.